Hello and welcome to the Risk Experience Podcast, a podcast dedicated to issues in risk management and economic policy. In this episode, we discuss the progress made in introducing a single currency for the West African sub-region, a responsibility assigned to the West African Monetary Institute, also known as WAMI. The introduction of a common West African currency called the ECO has been in the works for two decades now, following the establishment of the West African Monetary Institute in January 2001. WAMI was set up under the West African Monetary Zone arrangement with a mandate to undertake all preparatory works that would lead to the establishment of a common West African Central Bank and the introduction of a single currency. Today, I have the pleasure of talking to the Director General of the West African Monetary Institute, Dr. Ngozi Egbuna, on the progress of this monetary integration. Welcome to the Risk Experience Podcast, Dr. Egbuna, and thank you very much for your time today. You're very welcome, Dr. Frank. I am glad to be here. Um, this is a wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Very well. I'm grateful. So getting started, can you tell us a bit about your role at the West African Monetary Institute? I joined the West African Monetary Institute uh, in 2011 as a Director of Financial Integrations Department from the, on secondment from the Central Bank of Nigeria. Mm-hmm. I went back home in 2013 after my first uh, two years. And then in 2017, I was given an appointment to come back to WAMI as the Director General of the West African Monetary Institute. I see. So at the, at the West African Monetary Institute, I'm the Director General. And uh, my job really is both administrative as well as, um, you know, coordinating activities of our member states, getting, um, getting us ready for the single currency, ECOWAS single currency uh, agenda, as well as making sure that uh, we have economic and financial integration in the WAMS, which is the West African Monetary Zone, the zone that set up the West African Monetary Institute. Right. So that's basically what I do, both administrative and research. Right. I see. That is very impressive. So what would you say is the primary mandate of the West African Monetary Institute? Um. West African Monetary Institute, WAMI, was set up to carry out preparatory activities leading to the establishment of a common central bank and introduction of a single currency in the WAMS within the framework of a two-track approach to ECOWAS single currency project. Mm-hmm. Um, however, if you remember, following the adoption of a single track approach in 2014, uh, we have a revised roadmap and harmonization of convergence criteria by ECOWAS. Right. And so WAMI continues to pursue single currency objectives collectively with ECOWAS Commission in line with the regional framework for the adoption of a single currency. And WAMI carries out this by focusing on the following um, pillars. Um, our first pillar is macroeconomic convergence of the WAMS countries. Mm-hmm. And let me, for those who don't know, the WAMS countries are six member countries of West Africa, namely the Gambia, Ghana, Guinea, Liberia, Nigeria, and Sierra Leone. Right. So, and it's Guinea-Conakry, not Guinea-Bissau. Exactly. That's an important distinction. So, we focus on the following pillars, macroeconomic convergence, trade integration, financial integration, payment systems, and partnership, as well as capacity building, under which we have research and we have legal you know, issues and things like that. So that's basically what we do. Okay, I see. That is very good. So going back into the minds of the early framers, what would you say were some of the considerations that informed the need to establish the West African Monetary Institute to undertake the establishment of the West African Central Bank and also the introduction of a common West African currency? Okay. Um, you remember that ECOWAS was set up a long time ago. Right. And ECOWAS is made up of basically two blocks the Francophone and the Anglophone blocks, mm-hmm. or rather the French-speaking and the English-speaking blocks. You know, it's a very intriguing, diverse, uh, sub-regional body. And um, incidentally, the Francophone block uh, got into this integration process a long time ago. Actually, if you date it, you, uh, history has it that they started in 1946. You know, I see. So they've, they've been integrated for a long time, 
you know. And it took it took a long time. Each time they set up agenda for single currency for ECOWAS, we would we would miss the target, you know, uh, uh, over and over and over again. And so in year two thousand, uh, through the wisdom of uh, President Obasanjo mm -hmm. of Nigeria and John Kufo of uh, Ghana in those days, the two of them spearheaded the fact uh, the, the, the fact to set up the West African Monetary Zone, which set up WAMI to ensure that, you know, we have the two blocks. Because in their wisdom, they thought that integration would be faster if you have two blocks. Right. Rather than having one block already established and then seven, uh, six others, you know, um, with, six, with, with almost six other currencies coming in as a single currency. So we d they decided to set this up. So historically, that is the perspective. I see. That's a very valid reason for establishing the West African Monetary Zone, comprising six Anglophone West African countries. By so doing, an attempt to integrate will be more efficient if we have only two blocks rather than the Francophone block, which was already well established at the time, trying to integrate with each of the six Anglophone countries. And that notwithstanding, as far as I remember, we've seen the launch of the common currency being postponed on several occasions. Can we attribute this mainly to the differences in macroeconomic makeup of member countries? Um, it's not only macroeconomic makeup. Yeah, that is a major consideration. Okay. Because um, you remember we, when we, historically when we when it was set up in two thousand one, they started operation in two thousand one. The idea was to be sure that you have a single currency by two thousand and five. Right. You know, but then in two thousand and five, um, the basic fundamentals, which are the microeconomic uh, convergence criteria, were not really met. Every other thing was done, but the political will was not quite there, you know. Um, all the nice, convergence yeah. criteria were met, but not on a consistent and sustainable basis. And so they felt, okay, let's push back and start in 2009. In 2009, uh, we couldn't because of the global financial crisis which hit everybody and given right. the, the various levels of development in the zone, it was impossible to, 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 to talk about single currency at that time. And so in the zone, we decided, okay, let's push back again to 2015. But before 2015, ECOWAS came up in 2014 and said, listen, this two track approach is not working. Let's revert back to single track. And so they set up a roadmap with macroeconomic, uh, with macroeconomic uh, convergence criteria set up for us to go into a single currency by end of 2020. So that's where we are now. I see. So it would be wrong to say it is just macroeconomic um, uh, fundamentals that we are not right. Also, the political will was not quite there, mm -hmm. as well as the various shocks that our zone has been hit, you know, external shocks. You had the, We had the Ebola, right. you know, we had the recession, we had the global financial crisis, and then now we have the, the, the COVID-19, you know. So uh, the fundamentals have not really been, uh, before, before 2014, we were meeting it, meeting our convergence criteria on a consistent basis. Right. You know, but since 2014, it's been difficult, not because we don't want to, but because just the shocks have been, unbearable right but we, we remain resilient you know and um, like we say in the zone that what has happened to some of our countries economies if it happens to other economies they, they will be eroded from the face of the earth but we are still standing. <laughs> that's true but we are still standing right. yes right i see that is very good all right so in terms of the convergence criteria are these one-time requirements prior to being a member of the monetary union all these are ongoing requirements countries are expected to maintain even after launching the ECHO. Um, for now, that is what we, what we are saying is we must um, maintain the set primary and secondary criteria on a sustainable basis. Okay. You know, we were, the last time we had from 2017 to 2019, on a sustainable basis. But beyond even even when we have launched the single currency, for good governance and economic growth and development, you still need to maintain some level of um, um, a convergence. Right. And so if I even more necessary then than now. And so um, it's something that 
would, we would you know, work with even beyond the single currency uh, at, at that time. I see. Okay. So how far would you say are member countries in achieving these convergence criteria? Um, prior to 2014, 15, 16, we were really, you know, very good. Most of our countries were achieving them uh, on a sustainable basis. Right. But then since um, the global financial crisis and since um, the recession in Nigeria, you remember, and you know for sure that Nigeria is one of the, uh, in fact, it's the biggest economy in the worms. And uh, whatever happens in Nigeria reverberates all over our, our member countries. Right, right. And so um, the 2016 recession in Nigeria hit hard, not necessarily because of macroeconomic mismanagement, but because of the shocks that we got from the um, commodity prices. Right. You know, so, and you know, of course, Nigeria is a major exporter of crude oil. Mm -hmm. uh, most of our uh, exports, right. even in the zone, are uh, raw materials and um, primary commodities. Right. You know, so the, the shock in the price of primary commodities um, took us by storm, and so most of our economies were wobbling, and so we missed it. But the one, the one criteria that most of the countries have missed consistently on a sustainable basis is the fiscal, um, fiscal policy. Uh, some, you know, the one that says that central bank financing of government fiscal operations should be less than ten percent of previous years. Uh, tax revenue, right? You know, or the one that says a budget deficit um, on a, a commitment basis as a percentage of GDP should be less than or equal to three percent. We most of our countries miss that target on a sustainable basis. You know, on ev every time, and we we have done studies and we have linked it up to the fact that you know we have election election cycles. So you keep getting it right, keep getting it right, but the year of election, the thing is right. bonkers. <laughs> so you know? that is unavoidable. So, so that's why that's 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 what we are we are grappling with, you know. An election doesn't come cheap in this area. Right, right. So that's a very difficult one because on one hand the government needs to spend to keep themselves popular with their people. And on the other hand, they also need to ensure this fiscal discipline so that they don't violate these convergence criteria. So that's a very tough balancing act. So in spite of these external shocks, what is the outlook in terms of member countries being able to meet these convergence criteria? It looks very bright. In fact, okay. about three, three weeks ago, three weeks ago to be precise, we, we had a symposium for the, the one-day symposium of the governors of the ones, you know, okay. where they came and talked about, you know, the effect of COVID in their economies, what they have done to, to deal with it, uh, what they are going to do going forward. And um, it's not all gloom, you know. Before we went for that symposium, we at WAMI were a bit um, apprehensive. We were like, how are we going to cope? But by the time you listen to all the actions, you know, of monetary and fiscal authorities, um, you will discover that we, we, we haven't done badly and we're not going to do poorly at the end of the day. Yes, we have negative uh, growth mm -hmm. um, coming from this COVID, which we have not even seen. COVID has not even bottomed yet, you know. We have not seen the end of it. Right. But we are looking forward, and uh, the forward guidance says that we should, um, we should start creeping out uh, of it maybe the two, during the second third quarter of 2021. Mm -hmm. you know, even given the lag effect of all the initiatives that have come up. Exactly. You know, so a lot had been done. A lot of creative work, a lot of creativity had been done by the governors and the ministers of our countries that um, it, it didn't hit us as bad as we thought it would. You know, and so the outlook is that by the third quarter of 2021, um, all things being equal, ceteris paribus, um, it, yeah. things would improve. At least we would we would come out of the negative uh, growth and start trending towards positive growth. All right, that is very impressive. So, besides the convergence criteria, 
Are there other conditionalities member countries are expected to adhere to for being part of the monetary union? Uh, yes. Besides the convergence criteria, we need, we need the, our economies to be integrated in terms of um, the financial markets. Okay. Financial sector generally. Right. Uh, capital markets, integration, trade is key. Mm-hmm. Trade is key to integration. You cannot say you are integrating with somebody you are not trading with. Right. Uh, free movement of uh, goods, services, and people. And like we say in ECOWAS, it is ECOWAS of the people. Right. You know. So it is that it is the fact that you, you are free to move uh, around all the corridors, you know, of our countries without feeling, um, you know, constrained at all. Uh, also, the fact that. Um, Yes, we are moving towards a, a single currency. Pre- presupposes that our um, our economies should be converging, right? Right. So we need to have, you know, not not just um, a macroeconomic convergence, but also statistical harmonization. Precisely. You know. So um, right now we are working assiduously to make sure that statistics is harmonized. So if you are saying that you are monitoring um, consumer price index in Accra, mm-hmm. your basket should be the same thing in Guinea, uh, uh, Conakry, it should be the same thing in Banjul, Gambia, it should be the same thing in Freetown, Sierra Leone, it should be the same thing in Lagos, Nigeria. I see. So that you're measuring apples and apples and not apples and oranges. Right. You know, so that's, that's the next level that we are going into because we discovered that statistics um, is a big issue. Uh, especially when you're monitoring convergence, uh, you, 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 if you're not monitoring the same thing, then you're getting different results. Right, but doesn't that bring up a fundamental issue where you have different consumption patterns in different countries? So let's take a hypothetical example where you have one country having maize as a major consumption commodity mm-hmm. and the other country does not consume maize as much. Mm-hmm. If you end up having maize in the baskets of these two countries, even with different weights assigned to them, isn't that going to bias any statistical harmonization you are trying to achieve? That's the beauty of our zone, you know, and the beauty of uh, even ECOWAS, is that our countries, yeah, you might say the economies are diverse or at different levels of development, but trust me, in terms of consumption patterns, we are basically the same. I see. The corn you eat in Accra is the same corn you eat in Banjul. Um, the rice you eat in 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 Banjul is the same rice they eat in uh, Guinea Conakry. Uh, basically, our food is almost always the same, and you know that food is very heavy in the basket of of of, of goods. You know that we measure right in terms of uh, uh, consumer prices, and um, and even even in terms of services, we have we need the same kind of services. Transportation is an issue across the sub region. There is no country in the sub-region that has a perfect road network, right. that uh, transportation, um, they, that, that have a good rail system, that has a good sea, you know, um, ferry system. That We are all basically the same. If you go across, you discover that, except the fact that we were, you know, um, fragmented by colonization, we are basically the same people. Right. You to laugh that um, you would say that um, if you cross Aflao, you will say that, uh, oh, this side is Ghana and this side is um, Togo. Togo. But you can actually right. be cooking soup in Ghana and borrow something <laughs> from, your, from your neighbor in Togo. Is that easy? Exactly. You know? that, so, that's really, totally true. We are the same people. <laughs> Our consumption pattern is basically the same. Right. Really. right. I see. So, yeah, that is very good, right? So, West Africa is very harmonious in terms of uh, culture the food we eat and a lot of other things. The only differences you mostly see are the languages. That is it. Exactly. And even if you listen clearly, like me, myself, coming from Nigeria and living in, in Ghana for some time, there are some things they say in Ghana and I, I, I immediately relate it because mm-hmm. maybe the tonation is not the same, but it's the same right. word. Exactly. It's the same exactly. word. So we have, though tribes and tongues may differ, we remain the same. Right. We remain the same. Right. Yoruba that they speak in Lagos is cut across all the way to Senegal. 
Dakar, Senegal. Mm-hmm. Hausa in, right. in Nigeria is the same in Ghana. It's the same across. You know, right. so it's it's really not dif- that different, really and truly. You know, I see. Yeah. All right. So does the establishment of the African Continental Free Trade Area give a new boost to this harmonization you are working towards? Sure. Sure. Like I mentioned earlier on that um, trade is big. Trade is key to integration. Mm -hmm, Right. And trade is a major component of Mm -hmm. integration. So the after would definitely, if we play our cards well in WAMS, would definitely give a boost. Mm -hmm. Um, Currently, intra-WAMS trade is, as of December 2019, is set at 14%. I see. While intra ECOWAS trade is placed at about 16%. You know. I see. So that is so poor. Right. And you know that in in trade, you cannot do it alone. You know. So um, the, 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 the after will give us a boost because it opens up even the WAMS market and the West African market to the rest of the world and vice versa. Um, given that the headquarters of after is in our co- in our zone, mm-hmm. we cannot afford to be found, you know, napping, because right. East Africa, South Africa, they are ready. Uh, North Africa, they are ready and waiting for the whistle to blow to go on. We need mm-hmm. to get our acts together and find out the things that we have comparative competitive advantage on, so that we would present it to the world, the world in meaning Africa. Yeah. Exactly. So we should be ready with our goods and our services to to go come January 1st. What I doubt is the level of preparedness, you know, in each of us. But as for a boost, it's going to give us a huge boost. And I do know that our people are very resilient, you know, mm-hmm. and very creative. And you cannot right. afford to talk about global Africa without talking about the West African countries. So when when the time comes, we have a lot. You know, and we will showcase it from from cocoa in, in in Ghana to rubber in Nigeria to bauxite in Guinea, you know, to granites in Gambia, and wood in Liberia. We are we are prepared. The only thing is to talk to our people to now add value to those raw materials so that we get the pricing that we need. All right, that is very well said. So one other thing that comes to mind is that because West African countries are so similar in terms of their macroeconomic makeup, there is a risk of contagion whenever one country faces an economic shock. So for example, when a country is going through a recession, there is the likelihood of other member countries in their region being impacted through trade. What is WAMI doing in terms of policy prescriptions to safeguard member countries from any potential negative contagion? The thing about contagion effect is that, um, you know, from economic theory, right? Um, you know that um, you really cannot do much about it except to be proactive, mm-hmm. you know. And so we are saying to all, all our countries to make sure that, um, you know, we are resilient. Right. Once you're resilient, uh, the, conti- the, the, the shocks will come but it will not take you um, by storm. You would have some 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 um, shock absorbers mm-hmm. in your economy to take it in. For instance, when Nigeria had a recession in 2016, you know, uh, yes, it hit or it had a contagion effect on other countries. Right. But because because of the resilience of each of the economies, they were able to withstand, you know, that. And then, of course, the Nigerian economy bounced back mm-hmm. uh, it, soon after. So it, the effect was not that 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 much, you know. Yes, it 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 happens. But then we are saying to our countries that first of all, if we if we if 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 we exchange information, you know, and we know that this is happening in this in this economy, then all the others get ready with their own policies. To safeguard against the the contagion effect, you know, uh, uh, you remember that during the uh, uh, the recession in Nigeria, everybody was afraid for the banking system, right? You know, uh, because Nigerian banks are cut across, you know, all the countries of the worms, 
Uh, you have GT Bank across, you have Assets Bank across and all that. But the beauty of it is that each and every one of the hosts or home countries had their own home effect going. Mm-hmm. You know? And so, yes, uh, 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 the mother uh, institution is resident in Nigeria, but because it is already fully owned by the home host um, economy, Right, I see. Yes, it didn't have the kind of impact that you would think that the contagion effect would have. Right. And so they they, they took care of it uh, on their own. But then the the thing is that, um, like they say, you you know, we are stronger together. So Mm -hmm. the fact that we have that kind of thing, and of course, the College of uh, Supervisors of the WAMS did a lot to help to, you know, with because of course, finance is the is the oil that um, you know runs the wheel. Right, and so we, that was what what informed the fear at that time. But then the fact that we had the College of Supervisors also helped to cushion the effect because before something happens, uh, Nigeria would tell them at the college that this is what we are going to do. These are the policies we are going to you know have. The, and then the countries on their own will say, try and find out and do a risk analysis of how that will impact them. And then come up with counter policies to take care of it. So it was it was it was a beautiful thing to see them working together, you know, to, mm-hmm. to make sure that the 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 the, the impact was not that uh, bad. Um, the other thing that would have caused a, a bit of uh, issue is the trade, you know, the the um, closing down of the borders in Nigeria. You know, mm-hmm. but it's also helped some of our countries to now look in words and you know like come up with measures that help them to cushion, cushion the effect. Precisely. So regarding the financial sector, I will agree with you that although a lot of the banks originate from Nigeria, they operate and abide by the homegrown policies and regulations of the domicile countries. So it's going to be difficult for any systemic impact to reverberate through their region whenever there's a shock in one country. So by that, I believe the impact of any contagion effect is going to be contained. Exactly, especially when there is information flow. Exactly, right. You, know, you, you see your book, like, like they have the, the uh, College of Supervisors meet every quarter. Mm. You know, you come with yours, everybody sits around the table, they have a peer review, mm-hmm. and then they say, okay, um, a country that is having um, high MPLs will say, this is what I'm... I'm having, do you have the same issues? And they will say yes or no. And then they will decide, okay, this is what we're going to do to, to, to stop that, you know? And everybody goes home and carries out the same policy at the same time, and it solves the problem. I see. That is that's, very that's good. That's the kind of thing that we provide for them, the avenue we provide for our countries. That's the beauty of having this institute for economic and financial integration. That's good. That's very good. So West Africa can be separated into two main blocks, the Anglophone and the Francophone blocks. In your earlier submission, you had intimated that, particularly in the case of the Anglophone bloc, the leaders had thought it wise to form the West African Monetary Zone in order to effectively integrate with the West African Economic and Monetary Union of the Francophone bloc in an effort to pursue the single currency agenda and also the formation of a single West African Central Bank. To what extent would you say has been the level of cooperation among these two monetary zones in achieving this common goal? Uh, the coexistence of these two blocks in a single regional economic community pursuing similar objectives does not pose any complications at all. Okay. To the overarching di- di- desired um, single monetary zone in West Africa. Actually, that was the approach adopted within the framework of the two-track approach prior to the year 2014. Mm-hmm. You know, but with the ultimate objective of subsequently merging the two blocks following satisfactory achievement of some of the macroeconomic convergence and the uh, structural benchmarks, um, you will find that um, uh, I must admit that the harmonization of policies and statistical framework of these two sub-regions with completely different monetary um, policy arrangement continue to pose a little bit of challenge, mm-hmm. but not that it is not surmountable. Okay, I see. So there's a little bit of challenge to the convergence process in the mm-hmm. zone, but it is not that it is not surmountable. I see. If you remember, sometime in 2019, 
the, the countries of uh, Waimu mm-hmm. um, decided that they were going to kind of free themselves a little bit from the control of France. Okay. You remember. And so right. they, they decided to take some proactive measures. You know, it's all in the bid to work towards this single currency, this single currency agenda of ECOWAS. Okay. Yeah. I see. So let's touch on the proposed currency itself. There is the name ECO being floated around for some time now. Is this the official name that member countries have chosen for the currency, or that is a subject still under discussion? No, it is, it's been agreed. Okay. The heads and states of all our countries have agreed on the name okay. of the currency to be known as ECO. Okay. We've okay. also agreed on the um, central bank, mm-hmm. you know, the, 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 the type of central bank they want, mm-hmm. the federal, federal system of central banking. I see. They've also agreed on uh, the monetary policy framework, mm-hmm. which is inflation targeting. Okay. And so those things have been agreed upon. I see. So is the Central Bank of West African States, BCEAO, based in Dakar, Senegal, fundamentally different from the proposed West African Central Bank? Oh, yes. Yes, it is. Okay. It is it's, it's, it's exactly like you can say the Bank of Ghana or the Central Bank of Nigeria or the Bank of Gambia or the Bank of Sierra Leone. Mm-hmm. The only difference is that this one is for the eight countries of the of the UM1, right? Okay. Uh-huh. But when we are talking about the ECOWAS single currency, mm-hmm. uh, c- single central bank, mm-hmm. every everybody forms forms one, including that bank. I see. Would, would now form a single central bank. I see. So with once the West African Central Bank is established, we don't expect. ECOWAS. Yeah, yes. we don't expect this other central bank to exist independently. No, they won't. They won't be. They won't be existing independently. I see. They will all. They will all function now like a branch of the central oh, bank. Exactly. Of West Africa. Yes, please. Exactly. That's the federal system. I see. Mm-hmm. So. So, what would you say is the status of this project of establishing the West African Central Bank? Yeah, the status is that we, like I told you, we already have a. A name for the central bank. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only thing that is remaining is to have a location. A location, right? A location, and um, all the parameters have been set. You know, you know, saying where will the location, uh, the what would be the the main attributes of the location. You know, um, they have set all those things up. The only thing is to now bring it out uh, for all the countries to now bid. The the countries that want to host it to right. now bid. I yes. See. But as for the as for the conditions, they've all been laid out. I see. Uh, the statutes the statutes are already there. Uh, the standard rules and procedures uh, have yet to be determined. I see. Okay. Yeah. So um, by that, I guess that would include the governance structure in terms of yes, board membership board, and leadership. Board structure, membership, exactly. Okay. That has not been done. I that see. Has not been done. Yeah. I see. Um, so um, let's go into um, some of the workings of the, um, of the zone. So in negotiating with member countries, what particularly stands out for you in terms of pushbacks you've had from some member countries? Of the WAMs, right? Right, exactly. No, I don't I don't think I have seen any pushback okay. from members of the WAMs at all. I see. Our six countries are working hand in glove. I see, okay. You know, in, in every aspect. Like I said, even just two weeks ago, we had to have a meeting where they where they all sat around the table and talked about the COVID-19, um, what they had done, what they are doing, and what they are going to do going forward. Okay. Because like like we always say in the ones that um, once one country has an issue, we rally around. You remember doing Ebola? Right, exactly. How all the countries of the ones rallied around because it was it started with uh, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea. Mm-hmm. It was all for, from our zone. Right. And so we rallied round, and even when Nigeria discovered the cure, we, we, we transported it to all our countries, and now we're Ebola-free. 
So um, what I'm getting at is that we, we the, the, the brotherhood, the consensus that we have is, 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 is solid, is solid. And um, we, we have no pushback whatsoever. And our governments meet from time to time okay. and discuss on very high level uh, basis and the technocrats meet and all that. That's so it's um it's it's a wonderful um, union that we have. Right, right. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, we're working very, very well. And once a country, you know, screams about something, everybody rallies around to say because you know the the our people move very freely. Right. Mm -hmm. Our people move very freely. Goods and services move very freely. So um, we try to safeguard others because you know that once you're, like we say in West Africa, if your neighbor's house is burning, your own is in danger too. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I see. So have you had any indication of member countries willing to give up control of their monetary policy or they have some reservations? Because that's, that's a very big thing, giving up the independence of your monetary policy. Oh, it is. But like I said, we, like I told you that um, uh, um, 2019, mm -hmm. I think it was July 2019, all the heads of states of not just WAMS, mm -hmm. but ECOWAS right. agreed on a single approach, okay. which is inflation targeting. So okay. it's, it's already been agreed on, upon. I see. Because there were studies and studies and studies that, you know, gave us the indication that Inflation targeting will be the monetary policy framework mm -hmm. that will pay all of us collectively. Okay. So those most of us are under monetary targeting, mm -hmm. except Ghana. Right. Right. Which is inflation targeting, and so all of us are going to work, you know, towards inflation uh, targeting. I see. Including the Waimu countries. Okay. So one one other important case that gets a lot of mention is the economic recession of Greece. By design, they had to forego um, signorage after joining the, the Eurozone. So Greece, for example, um, had a strong reliance on um, certain rage to finance its budget deficit. Um, that meant that joining the Eurozone, they lost this large source of financing once um, it became a member. And this worsened its debt crisis and prolonged recession. I have a feeling this might be a concern for some countries that um, giving up independence of their monetary policy, their inability to print their own money and make um, some profits. Um, this might be a big issue for some countries as well, especially as we had talked about um, election cycles and all that. You see this pattern go up very high during election periods when there's a lot of printing of money because governments want a lot of um, these resources to finance their political activities. Um, I get a sense this might also be an issue of consideration for some member countries. Um, would you think that is the case? Yes, I think so. Okay. But having said that, um, we also know that data integrity is critical to stability in the monetary union. Mm -hmm. You know, the need for fiscal union as well as banking union are also very, very important after establishing a monetary union. Right. Um, an important, of course, of, of course, you know that uh, the Greek um, case, uh, as well as Spain and Portugal and all that, is very strong. You know, is a very strong case. Right, but and then of course their, their reliance on seniorage as, as well as um, um, the debt deficit meant that Greece lost a lot of financing. Exactly. However, um, I think the problem that they had in Greece was the lack of transparency in terms of data. Okay. You know, so for us, the lesson that we would we have learned and we would learn is to be transparent early enough. Mm -hmm. You know. So if you are transparent early enough, you would, you would, um, everybody will see, you know, that um, you are having a, a problem. Okay. And don't forget that um, we, 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 part of the, part of the agreement is that there will be some level of a stabilization fund. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So my assumption is that that stabilization fund would help to uh, cushion the effect of the loss of revenue from senior age. 
I see. You know, um, we also have you know common funds that uh, you know we, we, we that the the integration or the single currency we bring about. If you remember, if you know that uh, we have the ETLS and the um, common standard tariff things that we collect. Mm-hmm. So those will also help to cushion, you know, some of the impact of the loss of revenue. But key amongst all the things that I've mentioned is the fact that we need data integrity and data transparency. Without that, if, if, if Greece was, in quote, honest enough to bring out the numbers the way they, it was supposed to, mm-hmm. that would have that effect it had would, would have been... Um, minimized i see i see that is that's the lesson that we learned from there okay i see that is very good Mm -hmm. what are the discussions on exchange rate between the equal and other currencies is it going to be fixed or floating um the exchange rate mechanism has not yet been you know um chiseled out properly okay whether whether we are going to have a um, but we have a floating exchange rate regime that has been adopted okay. by the authorities of heads of state of ECOWAS. But let us not forget that the francophone countries are working under a fixed exchange rate, exactly, which is tied to the euro. Mm. You know, so that's 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 another level of discussion that we are going to have in the reviewed roadmap. Right. We are review currently. We are reviewing the roadmap. Of activities, I see, and uh, that's another level of discussion that we are going to have because under the old roadmap, um, the UMO countries have tried to wriggle out of the clutches of uh, France, mm-hmm. you know, and so going forward, we would see how far they've gone and would re- review the roadmap accordingly. I see, right. So this brings me to an important issue that had occurred in late 2019. Specifically, in December of 2019, the West African Economic and Monetary Union and Ivorian President Alassane Ouattara, together with French President Emmanuel Macron, announced the renaming of the CFA franc as ECO, as opposed to a replacement which is what the West African Monetary Institute has been working towards. Subsequent to the renaming, they mentioned that the new currency was expected to undergo certain reforms. In your opinion, do you believe this was a ploy by the Francophone countries to exert pressure on stakeholders to hasten the adoption process, having already been in the works for about 20 years now? Um, I don't see it as a force, but um, consultations with key stakeholders you know, could yield better outcomes and, um, and help to you know, avoid misunderstanding. Okay. You know, uh, but... Um, the move by the UMO uh, was applauded by our own uh, West African Monetary Zone as a move in the right direction. But all the information was not quite clear at that time. However, okay. subsequent, subsequently, we have ironed out all the, all the gray areas and things are going on fine. I see. So what would you say are the outstanding tasks to finalize the adoption of the ECHO and when are we likely to see a wholesale adoption by all countries? Mm, there are several tasks that have not yet been accomplished. Okay. Mm, several, several. Especially, you know, like when you are when you are walking towards something and you have a break, uh, if you look back, you will discover that there are some of the things that you didn't really do um, right. So key among them are the non-compliance with convergence criteria. Mm-hmm. You know, on a sustainable basis. Yeah. The slippages on structural benchmarks is another thing. Uh, the insufficient financial integration is another, as well as the limited legal and institutional preparedness. You know, because uh, you know that some of our governance structures internally in each of the member states is totally different. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, so we need to like work on the governance as well as the legal structures and uh, institutional issues to be sure that, you know, everybody is on board, especially the stakeholders, you know. So those have not been done um, very well. However, the political will is very, very um, high. Uh, Mm -hmm. They've given a a, a good boost to the work of the technocrats. Um, In fact, the political will is given already. Right. So what is remaining is for the technocrats to now work together and see where we would... um, 
you would meet, you know. And uh, don't forget that it's all done in a, 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 as a consensus. Right. And so, um, and, and so we are working towards it. I mentioned that we are looking at the, to review the roadmap. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, when the roadmap is reviewed, that is when we would now talk about a new date. But okay. Currently, the new roadmap is being reworked. Uh, we we tried doing it remotely um, over, you know, because of the COVID nineteen thing. Um, but we met we met uh, last week in Lagos, Nigeria, and uh, we are we are working, and a lot of work a lot of work was done over the one week, you know, to look at each and every one of the items in the old road map, see whether we are going, we are doing it right. And those that have been left undone, this is the time we are going to do it. Um, you know, for me as a person, not as DG Wami, but as a person, sometimes I say that, um, you know, when you think that something, when you think you miss a, a deadline and you are agonizing over it, if you look back, you would see that really it is a providence that has made you to miss the, dead, the deadline because really you are really not that prepared. Exactly. You know, so this is a time for, for us to look back and we do what we didn't do right. I see. And that's exactly what we are doing. I see. All right. So, yeah, that is very good. And um, that brings us to the end of this discussion. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for your time and your willingness to speak to issues and um, sharing your knowledge and information with us. I appreciate that very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Frank, for um, inviting me to your program. I will be willing to do it any other time. Um, you are doing a good job. Keep up the good work. And uh, this is part of our sensitization program. And I hope mm-hmm. that I've been able to at least explain some of the issues um, that agitate people and people ask questions uh, 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 about WAMI, about WAMS, and about the ECOWA single currency agenda. Thank you very much. Right. Very well. Thank you very much for your time today. You too. Thank you very much. Subscribe to the Risk Experience podcast and thank you for listening.